Are we good? Um, many of you probably got my email and part of bucket fill is something good is I make a joke of it because a lot of times we're silent or we're quiet. We don't say anything. Um, but in light of, of things that are happening in other people's lives, I think it's really important, especially today, uh, to share what we're grateful for, um, what's what's good in our lives, and some bucket fill. So don't want to pull teeth to get that out of you today, um, and I think we all have something to be grateful for. So who wants to start? I'm live. Chris says um, he is homesick, but he had a Friendsgiving last weekend, and he went to the Wolves game on Sunday. Which was amazing. I even was like kind of a fake basketball fan for like two seconds. It was pretty good. <laughs> you were a basketball fan for 1.9 seconds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when the three went up. <laughs> Wendy. I just wanted to thank everybody for their generosity and helping out the Amelies, Paige, and, and family, and my, and my sister Julie, that clan. Um, it's just been. My sister said this last week, she has cried way more over the generosity and kindness of people as they've reached out to her than over anything she lost in her house in the fire. Aww. So that's been great. And it's really cool to see how things work out. Tony happens to have, I, yeah, in quotes, I don't think anything happened by chance. He happens to have a house just like four blocks from their house that just happens to be ready to move in for rental this oh, week. Wow. And so they move in on Thursday into this beautiful rental property that has the same attributes as their home. And uh, the rental company brings the furniture. And so um, they will have a place to stay for the next 12 months while their home is being redone. What was really cool about that too is I was I witnessed this kind of happen in the, in the hallway. And Tony, I mean, if... You guys haven't ever talked to him about some of his properties or whatnot. He was like, oh, they just got to do this, 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 and this. And Wendy and I are both sitting there like, right, okay. And, I mean, he just, he kind of just eased, like, all of the stress of, like, no, this will just happen, and they can move into this, and this is how it works. Um, so that's really cool. Well, the family that had been renting it previously had the same situation. Yeah, fire as well, yeah. They, they had just, so he was totally familiar with the process yeah. of the insurance company paying him for the rent. It just super cool. Yeah. Yep. And we did have like five other agents, if not even more, immediately contact yep. me and say, hey, I've got a place. Do they need a place to live? Yeah. Right? yeah. And it was instant. Yep. Yeah. Super cool. All right. What else? What else we got? My dog's fourth birthday today. Oh, so, birthday. Dog. Birthday, buddy. Dog. Like dog birthday buddies. Dog birthday buddies. <laughs> Love it. Rick. I have two along those lines. Yesterday, I brought Tater in for an appointment, and she's got a clean bill of health. Yeah. Yeah. Back to being crazy, which is fantastic. My wife finally comes back tomorrow, so that'll make life easier. Um, and then I wanted to thank Chris Anderson for the invitation to the uh, Timberwolves game. A few of us went uh, to Zurich's and Jacob, and then we had one of the desserts, forgot he had an appointment or an event with the around. Now you're going to go there. That was very important. And so uh, our, our fearless team leader decided that she would change all of her plans to show up and go with us. So it, we really had a ton of fun. It was really cool camaraderie. Game was terrible until the last 1.9 seconds. And yeah. <laughs> so it was. I don't know much about basketball because I hate the squeakiness of the shoes. So like I don't actually watch it. <laughs> and I was like, man, they're losing. It's like they're losing by like 20 points. You couldn't really hear where we were sitting, but I hate this. I never shared that with you guys. And then all of a sudden, it's like down to the wire. It's 1.9 seconds, and I don't know what the guy's name was. He's super tall. Just like, <laughs> yeah, just yeah, just yeah, all yeah, that yeah, thing, yeah. right? The basket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they win. And I was like, I mean, it was one of those moments where it didn't matter. I was just screaming, like, uncontrollably because everyone else was excited. So oh, just I, I, I do have to share in the group text prior to you accepting the invitation. <laughs> Somebody. Somebody said it's game even knowing basketball is before we ask her. <laughs> you know, you have no idea. Is she, uh, okay, well, first of all, it's not because I don't like I'm not athletic, it's because I would choose hockey over basketball yeah. any day. <laughs> no, I don't. I didn't. Or elk hunting or something like that. Yeah, not <laughs> fun. What's next? <laughs> Who else? Who else has something?
Okay, well, I'm really grateful because we have 13 people now going to family reunion. And not only is it 13 people going, it is people that are top producing agents that um, a lot of times I think people think that trainings are for, oh, I've been in it a long time. Um, so if you're thinking about potentially going to family reunion in Vegas, if the, the people that we've named as top agents in the market center and in the region um, are going to this event, I can guarantee you will get one piece of information out of there to make you better either personally or professionally. So again, if you're interested, I know there's quite a few individual agents right now that are thinking about it, um, but do either want to share a room to be able to cut expenses a little bit, um, reach out to me because I have like a handful of different people that could potentially uh, work to do that together um, in case you don't want to just go up and ask someone. So um, I'm really excited about that uh, for February. Plus it's in Vegas. I mean, Jeff Homers might even go. I mean, we'll see. <laughs> All right, moving on. Do you want to talk about our um, happy hour today, Rick? Yeah, it's uh, so JJ's Clubhouse is actually right by Menards, right on 394. It's super close. <clears throat> and there's poll tabs there. There'll be, I'm assuming there's going to be quite a few people there, which is yeah. great. Um, and uh, it does, they do have a good happy hour. So one of the things we were talking about, talking about a little bit while we're there is we know a lot of people in the office are doing client events over the holidays. And so we were just going to talk about the different events they're doing, how they're going to connect with their clients, what that's, what's been happening as they're preparing for that event, reaching out to their clients, and then how are they going to follow up afterwards? So it's just one part of conversation, but that's something that we're, we're thinking about talking about. Love it. Awesome. Any questions around that today? Cool. All right. So we have our second uh, wealth building of our agent that is teaching it, which is Derek. And that's going to be this Thursday at 11 a.m. It's going to be in person and on Zoom. So if you attended Bethany's, I think that anyone that was here on Zoom, uh, in person or on Zoom, um, got some sort of information that they would either uh, desire to apply or already are imply, uh, applying to their life. Derek's is completely different. So I did have some agency to reach out to Bethany, myself, um, and just say, you know, is this how you invest? There are so many different ways to build wealth and real estate and Bethany's way works for her. It might work for you. Derek has a completely different way and that might work for you. So in regards to that, if it's something you're interested in, I would say go to both of them. Um, Derek has a ton of experience um, in the way that he also lead generates. Uh, when he lead generates for his real estate business, um, it's to build his own wealth, right? It's, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen any of the trainings where it's like, I think Gary said he used to go to his listing appointment. <laughs> he wanted to buy the house first, right? Um, that's essentially what Derek does. He sends out letters. He calls because he wants to see if he wants to buy that home before he even offers to list it for them. Wendy. I just, these are so valuable. And I want to bucket fill Bethany for how she prepared and presented last time. That was a ton. And is she sent out afterwards her slides for yes. us. Is uh is it on our YouTube channel so people who missed it can go back and see it? Yep. Okay. Yep. I think that was also potentially sent out in there the link to the the actual training. So um the training's in there as well as all of the information that she uh, gave out. So yeah, <laughs> it's it's really valuable information. Any questions around Derek's on Thursday? I and assume he's the same. Back from Vietnam just to teach this class. <laughs> <laughs> I assume the same will be for this one. This will be recorded as well. Yep. Okay, yep. 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 It'll be it'll be the same. All right. So you guys all got an invite. Maybe it was two weeks ago to our holiday party. I think we have seventy one RSVPs so far, but we are missing one hundred and fifteen. Um, so if it's something that you are thinking about coming to, or even if you are not. Could you please RSVP so that we have the right amount of food to order? Because uh, we will have to get those numbers in. Is it the end of this week um, to the uh, uh, to the place so that we can make sure that you are fed? Uh, I think that you want to RSVP. Yeah, that would be great. Just so that we know, and it's not just like lingering out there. Because a lot of times people don't RSVP and then they show up, which is fine. Uh, we just want to make sure that we have enough food for everybody. Fair. Any questions around that? Who's already RSVP'd? 
Who already picked out their outfit? Oh, yep. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> that, I'm actually not. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you that you know that. I know me. that. Um, okay, so we had voted, I think it was last week, about the Thanksgiving chili cook-off. Um, Lydia so kindly sent out a sign-up sheet, and it's going to be next Tuesday, right after the team meeting. Um, if you are bringing something, could you please go on there just so that we know uh, what everybody is bringing? You can bring chili, you can bring sides, you can bring dessert, um, just so that we know how much uh, food is coming that day. Questions around this? Lydia, did you get my? I did. <laughs> I didn't know how to do it, so I. I did. Lydia, did you sign me up? I did. All right, next. Um, okay, so a reminder for next week, we are going to be closed on Thanksgiving because it's my birthday, and then yeah, yeah. Friday, um, just because it's the day after my birthday. Um, no, just kidding, but if you need anything done on MLS, uh, reach out to Heather or myself. Um, again, we are, we're assuming that you're also taking at least the holiday off um, to be with family or friends, um, but if you did need something uh, kind of last minute, the office will be closed, just let us know. On this note, um, because of, again, if you haven't read the email, um, our broker, Kevin, um, has had a loss in his family. Um, so for the uh, short term future, uh, if we could just uh, take all of our broker questions uh, to John Butler, who's our operating principal, um, and actually used to be our, our broker at one point in time. Um, and then we'll let you know. You what? I'm a broker everywhere. You were. You're a broker everywhere in the city, actually. Um, so if you have any broker questions, um, if you could, and in the email, I did give you John's phone number and his email. Um, the first email, I forgot to put the K on the email, but um, just send those to him until further notice. I'll send out another email um, once Kevin is kind of back, but we'd like to give him privacy with his family uh, during this time. Any questions regarding that? Oh, this is just a reminder, mark your calendars, January 16th, we will have the required module here. Um, it will be $30, and we'll start that sign up probably next month or sometime just so we can start to get those on who wants to, who will go to that. But um, just know that we'll be able to offer that here at a super discounted rate. So. Awesome. All right, that's you. Can you just mention yeah. quickly, we forgot the slide, the party, the client, Wendy. Yes. Yeah. Client appreciation party. Client appreciation party. Yeah. Saturday, the first Saturday. I, I forget. Can people the still sign up? Or? It's the seventh. It's the seventh. Oh, yeah. The seventh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kelly's willing, which so, profile is coordinating that. It's awesome. It's super easy. It's 50 bucks for any agent, and then you can bring, you know, something you bake or something you pick up at Costco to share in the food thing and then uh, invite your clients and they can have their pictures with Santa and there's fun stuff for the kids. <clears throat> it's a great day. We'll be there. It's a it's really a great event. It's an event that you yeah. can have if you don't have any of your own events, you can join in on this event and provide this event for your clients. Awesome. Thank you. Thank all right, you. you. All right, me. Um, just a quick update. I'm sure pretty much everybody is fairly aware. Uh, rates have kind of pushed back to where we were most of last year right now. So we, we saw a dip and we saw it pushed up. We can see kind of the, uh, this is just the applications across the, the whole country on average on that one. So these are kind of the trends of when the rates go down and where they go up on that end. But what this tells me is actually pretty flat overall for the last year. And all of this though, is that demand from buyers. So it's still out there, right? Even though they're not necessarily new people coming into the market, what this tells me is Trying to talk to your buyers, it's a good time to go in there. If people are selling, there's a reason they're probably selling, as you guys are all aware, right? Um, it's an opportunity to maybe have to negotiate a longer, you know, sales cycle, right? You push out a couple months, like I know Alex had one that we pushed out from October to the end of December so they could sell their house. <clears throat> Two other transactions stuck with us the whole way through on that end. So it's there's a time for, you know, we can communicate that way. Um, on that one, so it's just that's what I'm talking to buyers about. If you can buy, if you find the house you want, now's a good time to actually act on it, right? Um, the other thing on the seller side, if you want to switch to the next thing too, um, 
it might be an opportunity if your sellers need to generate more oper or more interest in theirs, we can set up a, a temporary buy down to attract buyers. Um, I think the one, our one, one, which is 1% lower than market uh, for the two years is a really great um, program for both sellers and buyers. You can basically structure the deal so they get what they want to net. The buyers get both 1% lower for two, two years and that's their money. So if we can refinance in six months if, you know, the interest rates hit the ground, they can take that and apply it to principal. So they don't lose that money. So if you're interested in this, let me know. We can talk about it, um, what it would look like, and we can present it for your for your sellers and that type of thing. So, um, any questions on the on the market or anything you guys have heard, seen? Well, I think this is a great time when you're showing that graph on the buyers, right? I mean, I think our conversation around this time last year, a little bit before this, was a lot of buyers were like, "Oh, I'm just going to stay where I'm at," right? Or they went back into a rental. That was a conversation we had about a year ago. Uh, those rentals are coming up again. Right. So even if it was before and they never bought anything, they went back to the to renting or they stayed in their house. Um, it's like the, it's the new year where it's all going to start coming up again. And I think we all know that when we have holidays, right, all of a sudden you realize either you have too much room or you don't have enough room. And you're like, man, I need a bigger house. There was too many people in there or you know what? We don't have gatherings anymore. Right. And that conversation comes up a lot during November and December. I think, you know, January is that time where people are like, Huh. Maybe we should make a move. Right. Yeah. So well, and just then all those that if rate is the objection, right? You can show the last year has been pretty much the same. This might be where we live right now, right? And you're always gonna be better off, I think, if you buy now. And if rates drop, you're better to have been a, a homeowner and be able to refinance and take advantage of it, right? Rather than be out there fighting with everybody else who, you know, spikes the demand on that end. So I think you're you're happier if you can buy, you find the house. Now's a good, not a bad time to buy, as always, right? So let me know if you guys, oh, Rick, that. I was just talking to Jose like a half an hour ago. I don't know where he is. He's here somewhere. <clears throat> but he, he, he said, I said, how's it going? And he said, my buyers are absolutely killing it right now. Um, he said, I've got like one buyer, $50,000 under the current, you know, uh, market value based on his, you know, his analysis. And, uh, and I think there's a couple reasons for that. I mean, one, well, the main reason is that if people don't sell now before Thanksgiving, which is next week, you know, a lot of times we take those houses off the market and, and you know, put them back on or they're temporarily not available to show over the holidays. And these holidays are close. So I think there's a lot of houses. We think there's low inventory now. Wendy said this is the lowest we've seen since then. August 8th, 8th there's 6,211 houses. Yeah. That's our lowest number since August. Just wait until the Monday after Thanksgiving. It's a lot lower. So there's a lot of lot of sellers ready to to you know aggressively sell their house right now. So, you know, just in think. case those are canceled listings, I would probably just give them a call to see if they wanted to rehire that agent or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if they want to close before uh, Christmas, we'll call yours, Rick. We can do that, no problem. So, so <laughs> yeah, let me know though if you guys have any interest on the seller side or buy side, whatever. Happy to help any way we can. Awesome, thank you. Whoa. All right. All right. Yeah, this is you. All right. So we've been starting to do kind of the commercial spotlight uh, each month. Part of that is so that you get to know who our commercial agents are, but also uh, something that we've been stressing uh, over the last few years is that residential real estate doesn't stand alone, right? Uh, commercial real estate as it flows. Uh, just as uh, residential does. So I'll let you kind of take it from here and explain a little bit about what you do. You came in with a Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah that's what that's, I was just, I was showing a building in in Rockford and then Kevin, you know, is a firefighter too. So I, I'm showing one building in the building next to it has a fire going on. There's smoke coming out the doors, fire trucks all rolled up and here comes Kevin walking over and his Today? No, this is a, oh. this is a, no, this is a few months ago, but when you brought it, came in, I, I'm on the rock and fire part of too. <laughs> yeah, so, it was like, yeah, on the camera shop or something with dust and the fire. Anyway, <laughs> interesting how we intersect with each other. Uh, my name is Jeff Stedman, and I, not I'm always in here because I'll watch it on the screen in, the, in, in my office down the hall, but also uh, we have our KW commercial meetings where we all get together 
And from this group, from this um, center here, this market, uh, we have, let's see, there's a uh, Jeff Meehan, Royce, Pat, Tom, Lowell, myself, Greg, and Dan uh, Boswitz um, are all part of this commercial team. So we've got more here uh, as a commercial team to kind of help you in terms of as a profit center. So if you're looking for another stream of revenue, uh, you can, um, you know, refer people in and we'll get the deal done. You don't even have to worry about it. Get it done if it's, you know, tenant rep, buyer rep, landlord rep, um, investors that are looking for real estate as an option. Um, but let's see what's on here first. <laughs> um, I've got, okay, so these, I think everybody maybe has one of these, not one of these. Uh, you just handed them out. Okay. Um, these we kind of put together just to kind of help you as you're uh, listening, you know, in your calls and you're, you're listening and hearing what people are saying. Um, for as far as referrals over, you know, to get commercial things done. Not to let them go, might as well hang on to them, right? Just pull them in and say, hey, we can deal with any of your real estate needs, including commercial. So if, if they start to talk about any of these kind of things, uh, you could say, hey, happy to have our commercial uh, team member here help help you with that if you're interested. And just let us know, and whoever that is, put their name. If it's me, but me, Dan Boswitz, or whoever it is you're working with, you can put their name on the bottom. You can also ask us if you get if you get a lead uh, from, from anybody, just talk to one of us and we'll help you with the right person that can help you do that. Uh, and then, you know, retain your um, uh, relationship with that person, right, whoever you're working with. And then, yes, have us help, help get this part done and then get a referral key back to you. So uh, this is basically, you know, just something about our team, uh, buy, sell, lease, invest, manage, and to uh, the different type of property types that we do, just to kind of give you an idea that this is what we're talking about with commercial. So anyway, just grab that, and if you want to put it up on your phone or something, you can. But uh, just wanted to let you know if you need any more of these, let me know if anybody else in your group or around you wants one. We've got a bunch in our office. I'm about the third one down. Third one from the end. Um, okay, you can go on to the next one. These are just, just to give you kind of an idea of some referrals we've done lately. Um, this is Pro River News, work with a group that's buying, <laughs> buying newspapers all over the country and they are uh, selling them for the real estate. You know, get them in the building. This was uh, uh, actually not Seagull agent gave me this. So we're selling that to a spa group now. Um, this one up here was um, uh, transportation business. You know, that's they bring out the vans and buses. Uh, this was a uh, cannabis dispensary that we did. <laughs> that was a that was a nice deal, uh, made out of a former RV, by the way. Drive up, it's very different now. It's a climbing climbing group. We put in that's in here, a bouldering company right over by Carlson Tower. So that's gonna that'll be kind of a fun thing that's going in there. We work with that tenant to find them that space. Um, this was actually a food ministry where they wanted to have apartment revenue above, and then down below was a pizza place turning into a food ministry. So that was kind of a neat thing that this uh, uh, couple bought. And this one over here was a home audio store we put into an industrial building, but kind of gives you an idea. We've done, you know, MRI clinic over here. We sold a health clinic, airport. We sold a chiropractic. We've done a lot of those toy stores. Uh, shoe stores, dentistry, apartments, you know, just a, you know, all kinds of stuff with, with the commercial. So feel free to come in with any questions you have on that because happy to help. And we've got DSTs over here as an investment option to be a good buy. <laughs> uh, okay, if you want to go to the next one, this is just sort of the fun part. Just, you know, if you're interested. Um, anybody have an answer for this one? This trivia? Southdale. 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 South Dale. South Dale. Okay, go. Cool. <laughs> Yes. Oh, yeah. oh. Yeah. so close. It's so far. <laughs> Just across the street. <laughs> yeah. okay, next. So Southdale's older because it was like the first 73. First one, and they're redoing it with all the residential around it. Yeah. That, that, that's the neat thing. Okay, self street steam brands. Do you have any idea what uh, fitness concept that that's they they're uh, that they Eddie's right fitness. There? That's what I thought. I guess it's lifetime. Lifetime. Which one? Okay, which one is it? Ah, 
They don't have any time. Oh, oh, here. I'm sorry. I was like, they have any time for this. Time for, I'm sorry, you're right. Yeah. They're the parent of, and they're buying up some others. Okay, so the Twin Cities overall retail vacancy rate. Any ideas? In one, two, three, four. What's your number? What the vacancy rate is at retail? Yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 And the answer like is 20. 7 8 <laughs> Generally, very close. Yeah, neighborhood. Yeah, neighborhood centers are different from you know malls. And, uh, malls, they only put like five in the Eden Prairie Center this last year. Five, five. It's kind of going up or down uh, lately. Has it been going so up or down? Or... Of what? The... Like, it's just the vacancy rate. Is it getting better since? It's, retail has been pretty resilient of, of all the different industries. Uh, office has been the real soft one. It's like 30% vacancy in Minneapolis, but uh, this 7.8% is not too bad. Uh, it, it, that's overall, too, so it depends on what are you talking about. But um, Some centers are full all the time. It just depends on what area. It's really sub-markets for retail. Uh, okay, next one, 7.8 roughly. Cap rates, I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's just in a real rough terms, it's the percent of return, if you want to say it. It's more complicated than that, but just roughly unanchored class ABC. Look at, you know, uh, type center. Your real fancy center here, you know, nice center. Uh, that's, you know, it's got all the, all the death, you know, uh, national credit, stuff like that. Down to C, these are more neighborhood centers of 8 to 9% return potentially. If it's an anchored, like grocery anchored or uh, you know, Home Depot or something, or some other big center in it, uh, then seven and a half to nine, eight and a half uh, percent return. If you think about the interest rates nowadays, that does make a difference, doesn't it? It's got a little harder to get something like this unless you're an institutional buyer has a lot of money to put into it for cash or 1031 exchange or something to put into a DST. So, <laughs> uh, okay, next. Wall Skies, open a new store at Southdale. Where, where's their next store planned? Richdale? Richdale. California. Let's see if you're right. Yep. Oh, nice. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, okay. There's a candy thrown up. <laughs> or those $100 bills. <laughs> uh, okay. E-commerce. This kind of reason a lot of retailers, in order to be to balance what they're doing, right? To be to survive what's going on. There's more and more e-commerce going on. So how? what's the percent of total sales generally e-commerce is compared to all the rest of the sales out there, retail sales? Uh, any idea percent of e commerce versus just out of the stores? 36. <laughs> 70. I don't know. I'm not going well. <laughs> the answer is <laughs> well, the, the people go in, if you can do you know, a store that's big enough, it has everything in there, people will just go in for just in time you know, sales out of, a, out of a center, but 16% uh, overall, what they're saying. Thank you. One more. Uh, some industries are it's greater than others, obviously. Okay, next. Okay, this is in case you're wondering about construction. You can kind of see over the over the years, what's it, there's a lot of construction, and just lately it's kind of come down after COVID. But um, offices, uh, you know, 5.4 million is as far as the construction. Uh, just quarter, second quarter this year, retail 6.1 million, industrial 50.5, because that's Industrial is really what's see here in 24. Most of it is industrial in terms of the, the new construction. Just because um, a lot of things, right? They're using industrial for breweries. They're using it for dance studios, the climbing. <laughs> uh, just it's more affordable sort of quasi-retail, big box retail sort of. And, uh, also just in e-commerce and everything else that's going on with industrial. It's just getting huge. Uh, and, and they also have to, you know, Amazon has to have all these small, you know, uh, closer, uh, last, the last hour, closer, that's what they call it, <laughs> at the end of their shipping. And they got to have these industrial centers all over. Anyway, next one gives you kind of an idea. Does anybody know this? New Age of, Age of Village is being planned for what property? Yeah. Just the last one that But, okay. Where? Down the street. Okay, that's that's right. Right. I hope so. It is. Oh, it's oh you know, that's where they're putting it. They get a lot of <laughs> Yeah, they do. That makes sense. This has been reinventing itself, you know, North Town has, yeah. you know. And so that's kind of one of those that's kind of flopping in there. But anyway, so that's. Okay, next. 
Okay, Rally House. What do you think? Has anybody heard of them? No. Selling the ideas. It's coming into Minnesota now. What is it? Yes, it is. Gear. Oh. And then, uh, so it's going, it's spending in, it's Woodbury, Egan, and Maple Grove at the promenade. Hmm. Maple Grove. Okay, next. These are us. Where are they reforming into what retail? Uh, oh, like Macy's. Yeah. Or somewhere over there. I just in that. Macy's. Macy's or JC Penny, one of them. Any other ideas? Okay, those are good ideas. So not right. So close. Oh, oh, I can see that. Oh, yeah. They are partnering. Yeah, Kohl's is always looking for. But they're almost like in the same strip mall area. Yeah, right. Good point. So I don't know how they got support right. on by the same. Thing. Okay, next is. Uh, Everett's asking price or for rent, triple rent. Obviously, there is the ups and downs from that. But what are you asking rent for? You know, look at it from a dollar standpoint. Like what dollar figure per square foot? Think it's rent, not the triple rent, all the cap, cam expenses, and all insurance and all those things. But just the base rent. Uh, ideas on that? Five, ten, fifteen, twenty. Does it depend on what kind of property? Six dollars and forty nine cents. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it was going to be an odd, odd number. Yeah. Well, and you got to remember. That's an even number, maybe. Like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not leasing at 12 bucks. Well, no, I meant like a weird. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Eric. <laughs> I'm just repeating when I hear it. When I hear it in the gallery. Um, so anyway, get the gallery. Okay. <laughs> okay, now this might be of interest. Uh, holiday stores. Uh, which which okay. the, the, the circle okay. okay. Really? Yes, there is. Yeah, 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 the big no, my my uncle owns Teacher Point, which is uh, like a program, like a specialty program for all like the mom pa uh, uh -huh. gas station, so that they can like it's a reward program, so that they can compete against the holiday. But they all were excited that this kind of happened because. Everyone knows the holiday. Huh. No, you're from South Dakota. If you get a gift card for holiday, it's going to probably say it's okay on it. Uh, if you want it, you're going to give a gift card out because it's in store and also gas. Holiday Oats has the best snacks. You can do a clinch start play. Okay, and then the last one. Just if, in case you're interested, these are the people, these are the kind of businesses that are growing in the retail area right now. Um, some of them, I'm sure you're from the Northern Cap House over here. Uh, Starbucks is back growing again, at least in this area in Minnesota. Uh, but these are the people that we're finding on the retail Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, any uh any questions about commercial and how you can how you can make your botching commercial? No, but we're done with it. Um any questions now? <laughs> we're, we're down uh Greg Rand and Boswitz is on my team. Uh and Holly, Holly, my wife, Holly Sprint Marketing. So feel free to stop by. If you don't know where to go with commercial, you can ask us. We'll get you to the belt. Commercial person can do what you're looking for. So awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Great going. You're up. I do not like this. I just get to sit here and everyone else. Uh, like, this is what this feels like. Um, hi, guys. Good morning. And Kayla Johnson with Great North Title. Um, so this is me. Fun fact, we all were talking about animals earlier. Um, my dog came inside last with a random gash on his side. Ended up, it was a pretty big one, needed seven staples. Um, put a cone on him at night and then uh, woke up because he opened up the other dog. Took the staples out. So then he got stitches. And then he took those out himself. <laughs> so then he got them again. So if anyone's looking for like a lab German Shepherd mix and that builds today, then that can't <laughs> He's for sale. Actually, he's a giveaway. <laughs> um, so we kind of want to um, let you guys know that we specialize in all different real estate transaction types. 
Um, also, we have a special guest here today, so it's going to kind of get into this, but different um, estate tra transactions that we can do are Minnesota, Wisconsin, 1031 Exchange, they're on the residential, commercial, trust or estate. Um, if you guys are ever writing like a tricky PA and you don't know who would be the authorized signer is, um, talk to Mel. We have a really cool cheat sheet that we can send out to you guys um, to help you along with that. Um, and then we just remind you guys too, with the holidays, especially people being out of town, um, if they do need to sign electronically, we do offer that option. Um, so talk to Mel, it doesn't have to be approved by your lender, but that is an option for you guys as well. Uh, and we have a bilingual Spanish speaking poster. So if you guys run into that and you either need a um, translator or she can do the clothing and make sure that all the documents get translated um, and they're getting a really great service and understand exactly what they're signing. Please um, also, if you guys don't know, Mel did move in now up here, so she's right down the hall. So feel free to pop in, visit her for any questions that you guys have, or if you just say hello. And then these are all, all of our different locations. Um, we do have five locations, but just a reminder, Mel can post anywhere, um, nursing homes, clients' homes, coffee shops, things like that. So if you do have a client that's a little bit out of the way, um, there is no trip or anything like that, but Mel can help you out. Go to Pine City for you too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually in love. I'm so excited. <laughs> 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 it was yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would like to talk about value and what we can add to you guys and how we can provide value to you guys. Um, and one of those things is connecting you with uh, the top talent and professionals that you guys might run into um, within your business. So. Uh, there are a couple of different um, top talent referrals, transaction coordinators, contract for deed attorneys, trust attorneys, um, probate, and 1031. And with all due, we actually brought you guys an expert today. Um, so I would like to introduce Josh. Um, he's going to come up and chat with you guys about some 1031 exchange things, and feel free to ask questions along the way. And I'm going to swap thoughts with you. All right. Morning, everybody. My name is Josh McKinley. Um, been an investment advisor for almost 25 years, and have been doing securitized 1031 exchanges since 2008. Before COVID, I used to actually tour around the country and teach other advisors how to do 1031 exchanges. So I can I can talk about it all day long. Um, this presentation is kind of excerpted, excerpted from to our continuing education course. So if it seems a little bit incongruent in the presentation, it's just because I've kind of sliced and diced to try to get as much information as I can in this presentation in a more condensed amount of time. Um, you guys were talking about gratitude at the beginning of the meeting. I was actually here on election day and spoke with your commercial team. So I'm, gra I'm grateful to be invited back. Um, I think I ended up staying here for a couple hours talking to people, answering, answering questions. Um, happy to do that. Otherwise, um, you know, here's my contact info. Give me a call. Um, you know, we can move on to the next slide, I think. Um, oh, I'm not giving you investment advice right now. Uh, I'm not your investment advisor. I'm not an attorney. Um, so you've been warned. Uh, you <laughs> <laughs> so 1031 exchanges. Um, no gain or loss should be recognized on the exchange or property held for productive use, right? Business or investment. So any of your clients who own rental properties, townhomes, things like that, or any of your clients who are conducting business out of the property, they also own it's productive use. And as long as if you're selling that property, you won't pay any capital gains or any other shit, as long as you replace that property with another property that's held for productive use. So it used to be, you know, 1031 exchanges go back to the early 20s. And it started with farmers trading land. Right. You had one farmer who's saying, all right, I'm going to sell this 40 over here to buy this 40 over here. And they went to the IRS and said, well, why should I pay taxes on that transaction? Nothing's changed. I'm just farming a different piece of dirt. So 1031s go back quite a ways 
but they were literally like kind in those days. So if you were selling farmland, you'd have to replace it with farmland. If you sold an apartment, you'd have to replace it with an apartment building. Enter 1991, 1992, the IRS said, you know, as long as it, it's real estate that's held for productive use in the United States, you, you can exchange it for other real estate that you intend to hold for productive use. So you can't exchange for uh, vacation property you own in Mexico or France or anything like that. It has to be U.S. real estate for U.S. real estate. Otherwise, it's a pretty broad definition of what can be you know, determined or considered uh, as productive use real estate. Um, you must purchase an amount that's, you know, essentially greater than or equal to what you sold, right? Every dollar of real estate that you don't replace is going to be taxable. And all the taxes come off the top. So the first dollar that you withhold from your replacement real estate, you're going to probably pay full freight until you get back down to your cost basis. And I have an example up here that I can show you. Um, you have to replace all the cash. So there's no, you know, let's say you own a property debt-free, million dollars. You own a property for a million dollars debt-free, you sell it. You can't go buy another million dollar property, put $500,000 of cash in, borrow $500,000 from the bank and get back to a million dollars worth of real estate put that $500,000 of cash in your pocket, boot. And it, it's in that case, it would be equity boot. Um, and the IRS is going to tax you until you get back down your basis. So we can go to the next slide, I think. So here's an example. You know, why is it so compelling? It's because, the, especially in Minnesota or places like California, too, just the, the taxes are so cumbersome, right? So let's say you have a property that uh, you bought for a million dollars and you've owned it for, let's say, eight years, so you've depreciated over... Maybe depreciating a straight line over 27 and a half years. So over that eight years, you've depreciated 300 grand. So your adjusted basis is 700,000, right? You sell the property for for two million dollars, right? So you have a million dollar gain. Plus they're going to recapture that depreciation that you've taken. So it looks like my numbers are kind of not aligning here all that well. But anyway. We're talking marginal tax rate. So at, at the federal level, you're going to pay $250,000 of, of taxes to the feds. If you're in Minnesota, you're probably going to pay 9.85. So if you're sitting down with a client and you just want to use ballpark numbers, assume 20% to the feds, another 10% to the state. Um, here's the one that, that really captures people by surprise, catches them by surprise, depreciation recapture, right? So all the depreciation that your clients have taken. So let's say they've owned a property for 30 years, which is pretty common, and they wiped out all their depreciation. Now their basis is maybe zero. The IRS is going to recapture that depreciation that they take at a, at a flat tax of 25%. So everybody is just like, oh, I'll probably have to pay capital gain. So th that's not a big surprise. Conceptually, the numbers are off-putting, to be sure, but they, they expect that they're going to have to pay a tax on that gain. The one that, that catches them by surprise very often is that depreciation recapture, right? Let's say they go ahead. Depreciation, the accelerated depreciation. What happens if you check out? Uh, Same thing. Yep. Yep. So it's, it is. Yep. So it's going to be recaptured at, at a flat 25%. Um, so that one catches people by surprise. The other one's the net investment tax. So if you sell something at a, at a gain of $250,000 or more, now you're going to pay 3.8% net investment tax, right? It's the Obamacare tax. So you add all of those things up, you can get to close to a 40% tax bill in a hurry. Um, it's, it's very compelling at that point for people to consider a 1031 exchange because you know we're living in a world where you can go and, and make 5% in a money market, risk-free, FDIC insured. So people say, well, I'll just pay the tax, take my proceeds and put it in the money market and enjoy a risk-free return of the 5%. Well, after taxes, that's like 2%. So if they can keep all of that house money move that into another property. Now, you know, their, their tax equivalent yield is, is something like eight or maybe 9%. So um, not to mention these numbers just add up in a hurry and they make people pretty uncomfortable. You can go to the next slide. Um, I talked a little bit about boot, right? So essentially you just have to replace, you sell a million dollars worth of real estate, you gotta replace it with a million dollars worth of real estate, one way or another. You can't replace equity with debt, like I mentioned, but you can replace debt with equity, which most people don't want to do. Most people don't want to add cash to their transaction. So that's one of the way they could do it, right? So in that million dollar transaction example that I mentioned, you know, you sell for a million dollars, you will have a million dollars to the bank. When you sell the property, um, you're going to pay off the bank with the proceeds. Almost everybody does. 
Um, now you have half a million dollars to spend. If you only go and buy half a million dollars worth of real estate with the cash that you have, and it's not in your pocket, by the way, it's at the qualified intermediary. We'll talk about the different roles that people have. You know, essentially, you need a really good title company, and you absolutely need a, a good qualified intermediary. And then you might need somebody like me if you can't find somebody um, or a property for your client to replace the relinquished property with. Um, so anyway, food is any dollars that you withhold from the exchange, either equity that you don't use to replace the real estate or any debt that you don't replace either. So that's one that catches people by surprise too. Sell a property for a million dollars, you owe half a million to the bank. You go and buy half a million dollars with the real estate on the back end, you're going to pay tax. And the client's going to say, well, well, that's the, that other half million dollars, that was the bank's money. And the IRS is going to say, we don't care. You sold a million dollars worth of real estate over here. You only replaced it with a half million dollars worth of real estate. The amount of, of dollars that you didn't replace is boot. In that case, it would be mortgage boot. So you got to replace the bank's money as well as your money. And most people aren't looking to add cash. So you need good lenders to write good loans to get you back to you know, Mark Twain, right? The, the, the million dollar mark for the property that you sold. Um, any questions on that? <clears throat> we can move on to the next one. Um, you know, so why do people do 1031 exchanges? Um, defer capital gains is probably the most common one. That's gonna be their biggest motivator. Um, but they can use it to build, build wealth, right? They don't have to turn over 40% to the government. Really the investor's option on, on day one when they sell the property is to guarantee themselves a loss <laughs> of the tax might be a 30 or 40% loss on day one, or try to do better. You can keep all the house money and use that to build wealth. Improve income. Um, I see this happen a lot with, with farming families, right? They're kind of a unique, unique client, right? You've got a, generations that have lived on the same property for you know, maybe a hundred years. And now, now you've got the final generation that's living at that farm. The kids have moved away and they're not coming back to farm. You know, a, a well-performing farm here locally, you might get 2.5% return on your money. On, on a great day, you're going to get 5%. So a lot of farmers will say, well, you know, we have a lot of money on paper. We don't have any paper. Money. Our kids aren't going to come back to farm this land. What can we do? Well, you, they can do an exchange into something that, that might have a better yield, right? You saw the cap rates um, here locally on, you know, retail properties and things like that. You go from 2.5% to 6 and you don't have to pay any taxes to the government. Now you're earning, you know, six percent on a tax deferred basis. That's more like nine. You know, that, that's a pretty compelling story you can share with somebody who might have a, a property that's underperforming. Um, I was working on a deal with some clients yesterday. They own seven properties. Five of them take on passive activity loss every single year. You know, so they're not putting any money in their pocket. They they have these properties that are just, you know, not performing. So improve income, improve the asset quality. You know, you can go from, from a property that might be a little bit more tired to something that's a little bit newer, um, maybe requires less uh, maintenance and things like that, less landlord obligations. Um, and finally, change of lifestyle. That can come in when, we're gonna talk about DSTs in here in a second, where people are just like, you know what, I'm, I'm done being a landlord. Um, I'm selling my business, I'm selling this real estate. I bought the property when I was 30. I'm 75. Going up on a ladder just isn't in the cards anymore. Um, you know, people get to a point where they just don't want to be landlords. Um, there's passive options. That lease properties, like that were mentioned earlier, or DSTs, which we'll talk about in a second. You can move on to the next slide, please. Um, estate planning is pretty a pretty common uh, topic that I talk to clients about. They're really trying to figure out, well, if they're doing a 1031 exchange, they're often trying to plan for the next generation, right? They own an apartment building, kids live out of state, they don't know where the building is, whatever it might be, they're saying, all right, well, what can I do to prepare for this transition of wealth and maybe prepare my real estate portfolio for the next generation that doesn't have any interest in going to this apartment building every day? Um, Tax-free loans, probably skip that for now. Um, we move on to the next slide, maybe even. Um, Keep going. I think we can talk a little bit about this. Um, you can even go next here. I think this is probably talking about Delaware statutory trust. Hey, have you guys heard of DSTs at all? <clears throat> so a lot of investors will get to the point, real estate investors, where they just say, you know what, tired of the toilets, 
tired of the tenants, I'm tired of the trash, right? The free teas. I should say yes, I'm done being a rent. So they'll, they'll have a property that they want to sell, um, but they're not sure what they want to do next. But you know, in their perfect world, they definitely want to defer the tax. Um, and that's what everybody's motivation is. So every time I talk to an investor, first question is you're selling a property, do you want to pay a massive tax bill? Almost everybody says. Some people still just rip off the bad end of the tax, but um, most people will say, no, I don't, I don't want to pay that 40% tax. The next question is, do you want to be a landlord? And some people will say, yeah, they'll say sourcing and managing their own real estate. It's their business, <coughs> their passion, it's their hobby. Maybe it's a combination of all of those. Things. And those people generally feel like uh, that's the best way that, that they can drive the return on their investment. They put in their own sweat equity if they manage it themselves. And they might be right. They're, they're maybe even probably right. But there are others who will say, you know, do you want to be a landlord anymore? And they'll just start laughing. They say that we've been there, we've done that. We want to have a change to our lifestyle. Our kids don't have any interest in this real estate. Uh, we want to move on with our lives and, and shelter the tax, but have a more passive move on. Slide, I think. Um, I think I already I mentioned this already. In order to, to be eligible for a 1031 exchange, right? Held for investment, right? That's that productive use rule. Like kind property, really any property in the US, exchange for other um, property in the US, qualified intermediary. We didn't talk about that yet. So the key to a 1031 exchange is you can't touch the proceeds, right? If, if you own a property and you sell it, can't take constructive receipt of the proceeds. And that would include. If uh, you know you put a check, you get a check that you don't cash, that's still constructive receipt. So you need to hire someone, an unrelated third party, qualified intermediary, to accept those proceeds on your behalf. And they're going to hold them in escrow for you until you have placement. So really the way that it works, there's um, commercial partners, you know, CPEC, Jeff Peterson, you guys heard of Jeff. Um, you know, they happen to be we're pretty lucky that probably the best qualified yeah. intermediary in the country is in downtown Minneapolis. Um, it's a really happy coincidence. I've known Jeff for a long time. They're the best. Um, the fees that they charge are pretty nominal, right? So if, you, if you're facing a $300,000 tax bill, you got to hire Jeff to, to help you shelter that tax. It's like 900 bucks. So even if you have an idea, well, maybe I'll do a 1031 exchange, 900 bucks is pretty cheap insurance to protect you from a $300,000 tax bill. Um, and the other thing that they're going to do as a qualified intermediary is they're going to start the paper trail for you that you might have to use with the IRS, right? So they're going to say, Beller intends to do a 1031 exchange. So if the IRS ever comes along and says, hey, what's the story here? You can say, I intended to do this all along. It was always my plan or always my client's plan to do a 1031. And then when the property sells, the, the proceeds will go directly to an escrow account with commercial partners or whatever qualified intermediary. Um, who will hold those proceeds on your behalf. And that day, I think I've got the timeline, uh, maybe on the next slide. I uh, used to talk about that, we go to the next one. We keep going even. Here we go, timeline. So here we go, you think you're gonna sell a property. At that point, you should reach out to a qualified owner. From the day that you sell, you have 45 days to figure out what you're gonna buy that. Your client has 45 days, it's called your identification. So you go out, they hire you, and you go out and you shop around and say, all right, what could I possibly consider buying as part of my 1031 exchange? You have 45 days to figure that out. On or before day 45, there's going to be a form that the qualified intermediary is going to have that you fill out. And it says, all right, and there's, there's actually three different rules for identification. The, the most common and most familiar rule for people who have done exchanges is the three property rule. You can write down any three properties of any value. Day 45 expires, day 46, you don't have to buy anything, but if you're going to buy something, it has to be one of the things that, that you have written down and placed on file with your qualified. The other rule that I see most commonly used in the DST space, and we'll talk more about what a DST is, is uh, the 200% rule. So under the three property rule, they're limiting the number of properties you can buy. Under the 200% rule, you can identify any number of properties up to 200% of the gross value of your of the, the sale price of your relinquished property, right? You sell a million dollars worth of real estate, you can identify any number of properties up to 
gross proceeds, so $2 million in that. And it has to be an unambiguous identification. What that means is you, you can't just say, I'm going to buy a property in Minotaur, or I'm going to buy an office building in, in Minneapolis. You have to say, I'm going to buy this property at 123. In fact, if you have the property identification number, that's better yet to put that on file and that up here. Same thing happens under the 200% rule. Um, you don't have to buy anything that you write down, uh, but if you're going to buy something on day 46 and beyond, now you have to buy something that, that's on that list. So you have an extra 135 days to close. So it's a six month window in total, 45 days to figure out what you're going to buy, another 135 days beyond that to, to actually execute on the transaction. Any questions about that at all? Um, well, the third, I guess I can tell you the third rule. The reason I didn't mention it very much is I've never seen anybody use it in my life. 95% rule, you can identify any number of properties of any value, but you have to acquire 95% of what you've identified. So you maybe use it in a portfolio acquisition, I suppose, but you're really painting yourself in a corner at that point. So if you're so sure about what you're going to buy, any one of those other rules would probably work just as well. So anyway, I've never seen anybody use it, but that's the 95%. We move on to the next slide. Um, I already talked about uh, qualified intermediary. Um, talked about the, the identification period. People are greater value. Um, so you can you know, just buy the amount that you sold or more. Next one. Types of 1031 exchange. The most common one that you're going to see is a forward exchange, right? You sold a property today and you're going to replace it with a property that you might buy in the future. Um, less common, but but still something that happens often enough. You know what you really want to buy, right? The, the duplex across the street is finally for sale. And you say, well, if I can sell this property over here, I'd like to buy it. But everybody else in town loves that same duplex. So I better buy it now. So you, you buy the property today and then you use the proper, the proceeds from the sale of another relinquished property to replace the cash that you use to buy that duplex today. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, <laughs> in that case, you, you actually need a lot more coordination with your title company and with your qualified intermediary. It's, it's a more sophisticated transaction because the time frame is the same. You have six months to figure out how you're going to sell this property over here to replace the money that you use to buy the duplex across the street. So it's still 180 days. You're just buying property you know, replacement property first, and then figure out what you're going to sell. Um, improvement. This, I don't see a lot of these really in my business, but, you know, you, you say you have a client that sells a property and they want to use it to develop some land over here. Time frame's the same. They've got 180 days to complete that development, right? So they, they say, all right, well, we want to build a duplex just like the one across the street on this open lot down the road. Um, they sell the property, use those proceeds to buy that, that improvement. Well, I'm remodeling my house right now. It's a total nightmare, um, <laughs> which a lot is way, it's taking way longer than I thought. It's way more expensive than I thought it would be. And I'm sick of it. I, I mean, every once in a while, I just think about tossing a hand grenade over the shoulder. So you need maybe, a good real estate agent? Maybe. <laughs> we can just get know. you a new one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what would happen in a case where, what if the property is not done? Well, then you just bought as much as was built, right? So, you know, you get the sticks to stand up in the air. And, you know, as long as the windows aren't on a pallet, but they're in the wall, you know, and let's say it's a million dollars. If you have $500,000 of that improvement built, well, bad news. You're going to have to pay taxes on, on the other half, half a million dollars that you didn't use to buy real estate, but you sheltered some of it. So, um, you know, that's something to be aware of, too, because there's, there's a lot of folks who are very tempted to do things like that. For one thing, it's just hard to find dirt, as I'm sure you guys know. But it's really hard to get these things accomplished. You say, hey, be prepared, be prepared for what could happen to you if this thing doesn't get done in the amount of time that you've allotted. Because the IRS isn't forgiving. It is six months. 45 days to figure out what you want to buy, not 46, and it's six months, not six or nine, wherever it gets done. We can move on to the next slide. Um, Delaware Statutory Trust. So I mentioned um, 
there are clients of yours out there and mine ultimately too, where there's, they're just tired of being landlords. And, you know, and here's how I really work with, with real estate professionals. Um, on the surface, it, it seems like we might be competitors. Mostly we're not. I mean, I, my business is hard to see referrals. So I should get referrals from real estate professionals. But this can be used to, to maybe nudge the person off the sidelines who, who doesn't want to sell the devil they know. You know, so let's say you have a client who wants to sell real property and they're getting on in age and maybe they don't want to manage that real estate anymore. Like I mentioned, the kids aren't coming back to help. That person might say, well, why would I go across the street? I know that the boiler in my building is new. I know that my roof doesn't leak. I don't want to go from the frying, frying pan, better frying pan, into the fire. Um, and the answer is, well, you don't have to. You can sell that property and exchange it into a Delaware statutory trust. It helps your business because you have a client who was never going to sell, get off the sidelines, and it helps them to move to something that's more passive. <laughs> so a Delaware statutory trust, it's a security. And most people who have heard of securitized real estate have heard of a real estate investment trust, right? A REIT. Well, the IRS says uh, a REIT isn't like kind of other real estate. It's a business that owns real estate. Um, so you can't buy it. But otherwise, you know, in a REIT, you and a bunch of people you don't know pull your money together to buy an asset or a portfolio of assets that somebody else manages. Then you just participate in the economics of that deal. Go ahead. There need to be a minimum uh, investment for a DST. <laughs> yes. Um, usually it's a hundred grand. Off menu price is probably more like 50. I did an exchange last year for like 38 grand or something like that. So you have to ask, there's companies that build DSTs. Well, I'll, I'll explain the difference between a DST and, and a REIT. Um, yes, go ahead. Just a quick, um, just time-wise, um, He's probably got a few more minutes, but it is 1205 in case anybody needs to leave. I just want to make sure that we're conscious of their time um, and send your wants and needs to Lydia before two o'clock. But if you can stay, uh, that would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if, absolutely. You want to hurt my feelings. <laughs> we're all trying to conduct commerce one way or another. Um, so Delaware statutory trust, the idea is the same. You and a bunch of people you don't know, pool your money together to buy a property or a portfolio of properties that somebody else manages. Here's the difference. It's from the perspective of the IRS. The IRS says there's a revenue ruling. The revenue ruling is 2004 86 for anybody who cares. Um, that says real estate owned in a Delaware statutory trust is considered the direct ownership of real estate. So that's what solves your like kind problem. <clears throat> um, oh, there it is on the screen. Lo and behold, I'm glad I got it right. We can probably move on to the next slide. Um, so so there's 45 or so companies that put together DSTs. They also probably have a REIT business. So they'll go out and they'll buy an Amazon warehouse in Boston, or they'll buy an apartment building in Tampa. They'll contribute that property to the Delaware Statutory Trust. And once Amazon moves in and they're operating out of that property, they'll open the door for investors to come in and put a fractional in or own a fractional interest of that property, right? So that million dollar hypothetical that we were talking about, they show up with their million dollars, and let's say it's a $100 million Amazon building, they own one one hundredth of that property. It's like kind, Amazon's their tenant, it's probably brand new, and Amazon probably signed a 20 year absolute triple net lease. And so, and Amazon is probably gonna pay their rent over the next 20 years. <clears throat> so that's the investment, or an apartment in Tampa, 150 million or whatever it might be, you own a fractional interest in that property, what well, the client does, Whatever happens to that real estate is going to happen to you. So, you know, where does this fit in to your business? It could fit in for the person who just says, I'm done being a landlord. Help me sell this property and then get me into something where all I have to do is wait for the money to show up in the mailbox every month. Which it doesn't even do that. It shows up in their bank account. By the way, it's, it's usually monthly rental, uh, monthly rental income. Um, here's where... It's maybe more useful for your business as a backup identification, right? You you help them sell their <clears throat> warehouse in Hopkins, and you help them find a replacement warehouse in Edina. And if everything goes well, you pick up the sales side of the transaction and the buy side of the transaction in Edina. Um, but you have three 
three spaces to use under the three property rule, why not have a backup plan? I, I just uh, did an exchange with a guy out of New York City, sold a condo in Manhattan. He was going to replace it with a condo in Manhattan. On the 44th day, everything fell apart. He had a backup plan. The backup plan was was his. Um, so if there's space in the, the identification form, right, you sell that industrial warehouse and you find two other properties that the client really likes, they only have an intention of buying one, might as well write down something in the third as a backup and, you know, fully utilize what the IRS allows you to use. Or, you know, I always say it's a great place for leftovers, right? You sell a million dollar property, same one we've been talking about at Hopkins, and you find a great replacement property in Edina. For 800 grand, you have $200,000 left in the exchange account. Is a great place to dump those leftovers because they're going to pay full freight on the $200,000 worth of real estate that they don't receive. Um, solves the client's problem, makes them happy. Um, so, especially when I work with other real estate professionals, those are the two that are the most common. As a backup plan, the thing that they really want to buy, you know, in 2021, 2022 in particular, I had a lot of people hold their nose and buy a DST. It wasn't their first love, but one thing was sure is that they didn't want to pay the tax. And that's the biggest motivation that, that these clients have. You're going to sell this property, help me shepherd you through this process and make sure that you're not going to pay any taxes and keep that house with you. Right? Because in, in the DST space or even whatever real estate you might help them buy, you know, you can't guarantee them that they're going to make money off that investment. Right? I'm obliged to tell people you can lose all of your money in a DST. Probably won't. I've actually never had a client lose any money in a DST. But you're obliged to tell them that. Well, you know, if you get to keep all that house money, now you've got a, a 30 30 percent buffer. Where if you help them buy that replacement property and you dine or whatever it might be, even if it decreases in value by 30 percent, they're still better off than if they would have sent that to the government on day one. Because at least you know they own something. And maybe a chance they might get that money back. You know, once you write the check to the IRS, they don't call you in two years and say, hey, we changed your mind. We're going to give you some of that. Change your mind. We're going to give you some of that money back. Um, so you know you have a shot to do way better if you if you complete a 1031 exchange. I'm not sure what the next slide is. Let's be surprised and take a look. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think I I mostly mentioned this, right? So there's it's all institutional quality real estate. So anything that you might find in a REIT, you might find in a DST. Um, <laughs> diversify. There's I get called not every week, but often enough from people who own investment properties in places like St. Paul. It doesn't have a very friendly council, uh, the most landlord friendly environment. They're just saying, hey, I, I'm trying to get out of St. Paul. In fact, I'm trying to get out of Minnesota. In a DST, it, it's pretty easy for them to diversify around the country where they can own an apartment in Florida. Well, people think there's a hurricane every two weeks in Florida, but um, <laughs> You know, they, they could diversify their portfolio out of places like Minnesota that aren't the most tax friendly environments in places like Missouri, if you want. Um, Turnkey Solution, they're waiting for you, right? So, the guy who called me on day 44 with that uh, condo in Manhattan, there's 80 or so ESTs in the market right now. So, there was a place for him to go when he was out of time. That's maybe the biggest benefit to your clients. It's like, all right. We need to pull the ejection lever here. How do we have a safe landing? You can you do a safe landing in the Steve. Um, yeah, I mean, talked about all of those things. Oh, debt. We didn't talk about that. So, you know, I mentioned you sell a property for a million dollars, you owe half a million to the bank. You could go into a DST. You know, most DSTs have some financing baked in. And Right now, the average loan to value in a DST is probably 40%, right? Let's say it's 50% just because that's what the number we've been in the conversation with. So you sell that property for a million dollars. You have half a million dollars in your exchange account. Then don't want to be a landlord anymore. You're looking for a passive investment. You take your $500,000, put it into a DST that has a loan to value of 50%. Your equity is going to be replaced with the $500,000 of cash that you put in. And you're going to be allocated $500,000 of non-recourse to you as the um, 
And some DSTs might have leverage up to, to 85%. And I affectionately refer to those as debt dumping grounds, right? Because it's it's non-recourse to the investor. So it can be a way for the investor to clean up their balance sheet, right? Let's say they come out at 20% loan to value. They go into DST that's levered at 80%. Now they have a lot more free equity to go and, and shop for real estate with you. They're cleaning up their balance sheet. They've gone from a loan that they've promised to repay. You know, so if a tornado comes through, wipes out their property, and then they find out, oh, your insurance lapsed two weeks ago. Well, the bank is going to say, well, we didn't forget about the half million dollars you borrowed from us. Sorry to hear the news about the loss of your property, but we still expect you to pay us back. If that happens in PST, you're not happy, right? Because all of your equity probably got wiped out. <laughs> right, a meteor comes and hits that Amazon property in, in Boston, and you find out you don't have meteorite insurance. You're upset. You lost half a million dollars, but nobody can knock on your door and say, hey, where's that half a million dollars that you borrowed from us? You would say, I didn't borrow anything. Yes, he did. Go we'll talk to them about it. Um, so in an environment where it might be harder to for investors to replace debt, uh, I'm working on a deal right now where the investors themselves had a bankruptcy um, and the, the, the properties that they're looking at have some environmental issues. So the lender is pretty reluctant to get involved with those buyers and with the real estate they want to purchase. So their plan B is to go into the DST because the property that they sold, they sold the, uh, it's an apartment building, they sold it for 12 million bucks. They have $6 million worth of debt on the thing. They need to replace that $6 million of debt along with the property or they have a massive tax bill. They're not in love with the idea of the DST by any means, but they might have to fall back on it if you know they can't get the the the, the loan to buy the replacement property. And it's past their 45 days, so they are you know, they can either do Plan A or Plan B, and might get pushed into Plan B, which is is working for me. So let's see what's next. I'm not even sure what to expect. Um, oh, 721 up reads. So you're you know we talked about reads. REITs don't qualify as like kind under section 1031, but you have folks who, who may be saying, all right, I don't want to do a 1031 exchange and continue to be locked into real estate forever, right? Because the reason that most people will do a 1031 is they want to swap till they drop, right? They just want to keep on kicking that tax can down the road. One day they'll die. When they die, they'll figure out what their real estate is worth on the date of death. And then their, their kids are going to sell it and when they sell it, the kids aren't going to do a 1031 exchange because they got to step up in the cost state, which means if they sell it on the day that you die, the taxes that they would owe is zero, right? You have that million dollar property that your parents bought in 1975 for 100 grand, that now they have a $900,000 or $900, gain, they die, you get to step up in that basis, you sell that day, the estate pays no tax. <laughs> so that, that is... You know, number one is I don't want to pay any taxes today. Number two is I don't want to pay any taxes ever. So flop play um, But others will say, well, I wouldn't mind having some access to some of this principle. Is there a way I could do that? You know, and if they're working in a, for with a fee simple solution, right? You, you sell today, you exchange into the duplex across the street. You could do a cash out refi. With your, your lending friends the next day, put some of that money in the bank. You just, you know, you have to complete the 1031 first. Whatever happens after that, you know, is between you and your lender and your God, probably. Um, in a in a securitized transaction, it's not that simple. In a 1031 exchange, the IRS says, we want to believe that you want to continue to own real estate because you really love owning real estate. And you're not motivated by the tax shelter. The opposite is true. Everybody's motivated by the tax shelter. So they'll continue to own real estate reluctantly in some cases. In a 721 upread, you would do an exchange into a, a DST. You have to stay in that DST for two years um, to avoid a step transaction. And after two years, a REIT will buy that property from you and all the other investors in the DST. And instead of giving you cash for the real estate that you own in the Delaware Statutory Trust, they're going to give you shares of the REIT. That's not a taxable transaction. Not taxable. You're not allowed to sell those shares for another 12 months. So it's a three-year journey 
once the three years is over, now you can call up the REIT and say, you know, I have a million dollars in your REIT, send me 50 grand. So it puts a, those investors in a position to have access and liquidity in their real estate. And it also gives them a little bit of control, control of their taxes, right? You have a $900,000 gain, hit your taxes this year, you're going to pay full freight. If you have $50,000 of income, it might take you a while. Instead of paying 20% in federal capital gains tax, you might only pay 15. Instead of paying 10 to, to Minnesota, you might pay six. Well, you know, now your money is that much more valuable. You didn't take on any additional incremental risk, but your money is that much more valuable because you're not going to have a tax hit land on your tax return all at once. Um, once you're in the up rate, it's game over for future 1031 exchanges. So, you know, the REIT is your destiny. And then the same thing is true from the state planning standpoint. If you die, all of your shares in that REIT, you get a step up in basis, your estate liquidates all those shares the day you die, they pay for that. If, if you liquidate before you die, by the way, it's, it's prorated, right? So in the hypothetical we were using, um, you know, let's say you had $900,000 gain, $100,000 basis, 90 cents, you take out a dollar, 90 cents of it is going to be taxed one way or another, and you won't pay any tax on your basis, but when you die, you get to step up in basis. So you see, I see 721 upreads for folks who are older, right? If you're 98 years old, you might not want to commit to a DST that's going to be, where you're going to be invested for 10 years, because you're probably not going to live to be 108. Um, so that they'll do that planning for their estate, where it's like, all right, well, I might die in this two years. Um, you know, what can my estate do if they could cash out those shares? By the way, this is one that, you know, the funny thing about 1031 exchanges is I still learn new things all the time. This is one that I didn't know until this summer. If you die in the middle of an exchange, your estate better complete the exchange. Because um, otherwise, you're, you're, you are still alive uh, in the middle of that transaction. Um, it's incomplete, your state's gonna have to pay the taxes. So um, in this case, sadly, the one of the clients was on her deathbed. And so they're just like, well, what do we do? They said, delay the closing. Buy yourself as much time as you can. Go to the buyer and see if they'll block with you. Buy your debt. Most people are compassionate. Some people are monsters, but most people aren't. Um, so anyway, I think that's probably it. We can we can double check. Yeah, any questions? Um, you know, I'll stick around. If anybody has any questions, feel free to give me a call. Um, if you're talking about client events, I speak in front of clients all the time. Talk about how how this process works. Um, you know, my charisma is infectious, so they can't get enough of me <laughs> speaking in front of the group. So. Um, you know, feel free to use me as a resource. Um, you know, it, it should be collaborative. I'm not here looking to pick anybody's pocket. Um, you know, they, they use the DST as first utility, backup plans, debt replacement, leftovers, or nudge your seller who just doesn't want to sell. It's just like, here's a place where you can go that doesn't require you to do anything. That's that's usually how I work with people. Yeah, thanks, you guys. Thanks for all the time. Okay. Thank you.